Hi, my name is Anita Novak, and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 11 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I am joined by the one and only Ray Zahab, who is a Canadian explorer, ultra distance runner, and founder of ImpossibleToPossible.com, a not profit organization that aims to inspire and educate youth through adventure learning, inclusion, and participation in expeditions. He has run over 17,000 kilometers across the world's deserts and unsupported expeditions in some of the coldest places on the planet. No wonder why Canadian Geographic recognized Ray as one of Canada's top explorers in 2015. Ray is also the author of two books about his life and adventures. One is called Running for My Life, and the second is Running to Extremes. Both books focus on Ray's transition from an unhealthy life both physically and emotionally, to an ultra runner and beyond, and the philosophy that we're all capable of achieving extraordinary things with our lives. Welcome to the show, Ray. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So long. I haven't seen you in so in such a long time, and it, and and uh, I can't wait to do this um, recording. This month, we're focusing on people who I've talked about in my book and written stories about um, as sort of like living embodiments of purposeful empathy. So I'm going to read from chapter three. Off we go. Ray Zahab, who ran an 111-day marathon across the North African desert, captured in a documentary film narrated by Matt Damon, is also grateful to have found his calling. Born in 1969 and raised on a horse farm, Ray led a life that consisted of coffee, booze, and cigarettes. Unhealthy and awash in self-pity, he drifted aimlessly in and out of odd jobs for years. And on New Year's Day of the new millennium, Ray woke up hungover on his brother's living room couch. He spotted an ashtray overflowing with cigarette butts and remembered that he'd smoke his last one of the night all the way down to the filter. Disgusted with himself, he reached for a magazine on the coffee table and started skimming the pages. He came across an article about the Yukon Arctic Ultra Marathon, considered the toughest foot race in the world because it requires competitors to drag their supplies 99 miles by sled across a frozen abyss. The story's cover photo featured a man who had just crossed the finish line, radiating triumph and bliss. In that moment, Ray vowed to compete in the next race. After three months of training as a long distance runner, the incredible happened. Ray ran the race and finished first. Nearly overnight, he had become an ultra marathon champion. Hooked on the sport, he began to train in earnest and competed in many other races around the world, winning several more. In 2016, he set out on his biggest challenge yet, to run across the Sahara Desert to draw attention to H2O Africa, which is now known as water.org, an NGO devoted to clean drinking water. Accompanied by two ultramarathon friends, he ran from Senegal to Egypt, covering an average of 39 miles per day. The trio ran through sandstorms, injury, illness, and 100 plus Fahrenheit degree for nearly four months straight without missing a single day. Awake by 5 a.m., they'd eat for an hour and run until noon. They'd break for a few hours to eat and rest and then run some more. Short days ended at 6 p.m., long ones at 11 p.m., depending on the running conditions. In Niger, the sand was so soft that Ray and his buddies sank up to their ankles with each step. They consumed at least 6,000 calories per day, forgoing water because it had none, and took just two showers on the entire journey. By the time the trio reached Egypt, they could taste the finish line. They ran more than 60 miles per day for an entire week and completed the final 186 miles to the Red Sea in a mind-boggling 60-hour sprint on just two hours of sleep. Ray celebrated with an ice-cold beer and a juicy cheeseburger at a five-star hotel. His meal was delicious, but the lasting taste in his mouth was an epiphany. I used to be a pack-a-day smoker, but I just ran across the African continent. We underestimate ourselves, but are all capable of extraordinary things. That's when Ray made three important life decisions. He co-founded Impossible to Possible, a nonprofit organization dedicated to encouraging youth to reach beyond their limits. He committed to competing in races only if they could be leveraged for social good. 
And finally, he decided to step up as a role model. While his feet did the busy work of running across the Sahara to draw attention to the water crisis, his eyes bore witness to what water scarcity meant for real people, families, and communities. This cemented his resolve to engage in a lifetime of purposeful empathy. To Ray, sitting on the sign lines while others suffer is simply not an option, and he rejects all excuses to the contrary. Limitations are 90% mental, he says, and the other 10% is all in our head. What a great mantra for an empathy manifesto. You. So there we go. I mean, you, there's okay. There's a couple of things. I mean, so now <laughs> listen. I I yeah. I grew up on a on a horse farm. Had an amazing childhood. Uh, my brother and I running around in the outside, living in the country. I would say it wasn't until I was later in life and getting older that you know into my twenties that I sort of just you know found myself sort of lost, purposeless, passionless in life without direction. And when I made that final decision, it was about a three-year process to make that decision to go from pack-a-day smoker to quitting smoking. And um, with my brother's help, and, you know, it, it's funny, you know, we, we live our lives, and we live our lives with a, an identity outside and sometimes inside. And outside, I was this very happy, everybody knew me as this happy-go-lucky person, but inside, as you would mentioned, I was this very unhappy person. So when I finally made that decision and committed to it and quit smoking on that actual day on New Year's Eve, uh, 99, January 1st, 2000, I would spend the next three years learning about the outdoors from my brother, um, started out, you know, ice climbing. And if you remember that story, I think I told you that story about the first thing I really big thing I did was I went ice climbing with my brother. Um, and it felt like I'd summited Mount Everest climbing my first waterfall. And then three short years after that, uh, I read that article that you mentioned, and lo and behold, I did my first running race ever, which was the Yukon Arctic Ultra. And as they say, you know, I never looked back. I mean, that's that's just sort of been my life since then, right? Yeah. And I wonder if you could say a few words to anybody who you think, not you think, who may be listening or watching, saying, you know, I'm not living my best life and listen to this guy and all that he's accomplished. I mean, I'll never be that. But what would you say to nudge somebody towards sort of a, a life that feels more inspiring? Well, you know what? Here's the reality. The great things that we do in our life are very relative to us as individuals, as are the challenges and the difficulties that we face in life. I mean, what may be difficult for you may not be so difficult for me and what might be super like a huge mountain to climb for me like a very difficult personal challenge would be something that you would take on and say big deal i could do it so it's all very relative to us as individuals so the successes that we have can't really be compared to anything else so it's finding the thing that we're passionate about it doesn't have to be something like uh climbing mount everest it could be baking the perfect cake it could be whatever making the perfect espresso which i still strive to do i mean it could be anything in life that it could be our kids, it can be our whatever it is. It's just finding that one thing in your life that drives a passion and fuels you. And from that, uh, other things, amazing things will happen in your life. I mean, it just, it's the trajectory that we put ourselves on. Negativity and self-doubt and uh, talking ourselves out of doing things and not taking risks and all of it are like a warm sleeping bag. They're very easy to get comfortable with. But being happy and being driven for many of us is something that we have to work at. And you don't just become happy one day. You work at being happy. Like anything else in your life that is very meaningful, there is a process to attaining it. And I see your T-shirt moving. So I feel like maybe you're on a stationary I'm on the go. That... Yeah, I feel you like are, I am. Eh? I'm just bouncing around. You're I'm exercising around like, right once now. Once the need is done, I'm going running. That's <laughs> Nice. Okay. That's amazing. Okay. So we know that you obviously are using your body in the most extreme ways to, to endure, endure, I say endure, but to enjoy, maybe enjoy for you, endure for me, all these incredible, um, you know, physical uh, challenges that you take on. Yeah. You have just lived uh, quite a physical challenge. Let's talk about that. You sure. are now finished with cancer treatments. Can you take us yes. back to when you got the news and how you managed it all yes yeah, so for the last year uh i had been feeling uh well we're going on a year and a half 
now, um, I'd been feeling not myself. So I'd been feeling uh, lack of energy, um, foggy headed, um, uh, an inability to recover from my longer workouts. And I wasn't sure what was going on. And I thought, well, you know what? I had COVID a few times. Maybe it's long COVID. Um, you know, maybe I'm just exhausted. Maybe I'm getting older. I mean, I, who knows, right? I'm not, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So maybe that's it. And what I came to realize, and, and, you know, I'm very in tune with my body. You know, I know when something's right and I know when something's wrong, but I became, um, almost like I was going to give in to this whole thing and be like, oh, well, that's just the way it is now. And, and I'll try to adapt downward because you adapt downward. I mean, when you're before, when I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, going up a set of stairs was impossible, right? I mean, it was just hard to do. And then fast forward a few years and I'm running and mountain biking and doing all these things and I'm running upstairs and I'm like, oh, wait a sec, I'm running upstairs, it, right? You, you, you forget when you feel crappy, what it's like to feel good. So at any rate, that's how I kind of felt last year. And then my my wife's insistence, I went and started getting blood work done. And like, lo and behold, everything's all wacky, right? And it didn't take them too long to figure out that I had a form of lymphoma, a blood cancer, a rarer form of it. And it was sometimes symptomatic, sometimes not. Mine was extremely symptomatic. And it was um, very, very difficult to function. And so for the last six months, I've been in chemotherapy and monoclonal therapy and I just finished. So I would go, you know, three days of, I do two chemos and a monoclonal session over the course of two days, I'm sorry. And uh, the first day of the three would be actually just blood work and stuff like that. And then I would have a 25 day break and then I would go back in again. And this went on for six months and I would get the key. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I'm telling you, it's terrible. I would feel horrible for days afterwards. For the first couple of days, as a matter of fact, that it was I just laid on the couch. That's all I could do, or lay in bed. And then I would will myself to get moving again. And it would take me a few days. Take me by the end of the first week, I was comfortable hiking again and doing things. And then at the start of week two, I'd start running a little bit. And then I would set a goal for myself each month. And I had about 10 days where I felt okay. And in those 10 days, I would either guide my clients that I, you know, with my guiding business in a place, in a part of the world somewhere, or I would, um, my youngest daughter, who's just sitting over there, and I would, uh, went to Death Valley uh, and, and you know, did an adventure of our own. Um, it, you know, I was on the go. I did an Arctic expedition, which I had to abbreviate, but I wasn't willing to give up on it. And basically for... For me, in that six-month period or this past six-month period, I decided that I wasn't going to stop, but that I appreciated I had to adjust my life, and I had to adapt to what my current situation was and know that at some point, there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, and I'll move on from there. And as a matter of fact, I was talking to a friend this morning, and I'll let you move on with your next question because I'm getting a little windy here, uh, talking too long. But I was talking this morning to a friend of mine, and they said, well, hopefully this is behind you now. And it's cured. And I said, well, actually, there is no cure for what I have. I mean, the reality is I'll get to the average two to five good years. And then I'm going to go back in and do this all over again. But I'm going to tell you something. I said to him, I'm stoked to have two good years. Like if I can have two to five really good years feeling like I did two or three years ago, like that fantastic, then it's worth it. I'll go back in and do this chemo game, whatever, right? So it's perspective. It's how we look at things as well. But then again, I also have friends that have suffered much worse cancers and the prognosis is not as good as mine. And so we each have these relative situations in our life and it's how we deal with them that I think is, that is the most you, important thing to us as individuals. And do you sense that um, uh, part of your mental training, having done these long expeditions and just really having the experience of mind over matter has actually helped you in these circumstances? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, I think that what it's done, expeditions have taught me that you create an internal resilience. You know, uh, you create a mechanism by which to deal with adversity. Now, comparing an expedition, I also wrote this in a social media post when I had said that, hey, I'm done with all this chemo, is probably it's the most difficult thing I've ever done. 
and I and I think the reason is because when I go on an expedition, um, no matter how long it is, the 111 days that you mentioned in the Sahara in 2006, seven, that we when we crossed the Sahara, you knew you were going to get up and do it all over again. But then eventually, every day was one day left, and you would get to the finish, right? If if we were physically able to make it to the finish, with this, it was like it was like a monthly roller coaster where I'd get through it, and I'd be like, oh my god. Like that's like, I was nauseous. You're miserable. You're just, you know, and then you start to get better, but then you know that it's coming again. Right. And another friend of mine had mentioned to me, well, the good news is that you know how bad it feels. And I said, yeah, you're right. I do. I know how lousy I'm going to feel, but also it's like you're a carpenter and you whack your finger with the hammer, right? And your nail goes black. And then, you know, every month, at a specific time, at a specific day, you're going to whack that finger again. It's not something you're going to look forward to, but you have to just accept that that's your situation, right? Uh, so the yeah, expeditions, expeditions have prepared me for that, you know? I'm so happy that the worst of it is in the rearview mirror and that uh, it was a successful treatment and that it's just so incredible that you were doing even if you say an abbreviated expedition while you were through treatment it's just it's a remark it's very inspiring right it's very inspiring hey i don't mean to interrupt a great conversation i just want to draw attention to the fact that there are over 120 equally awesome conversations of my podcast and youtube series on my channel please subscribe the world needs more empathy and you have a role to play and so I want to talk about the business that you have on expeditions, but first let's talk about impossible to possible because sure. the reason, the reason I think of you as uh, exemplifying purposeful empathy is that you can relate with empathy to young people who may be uh, confused or depressed or unhappy like you were, you know, when you were a pack a day smoker and given the, the successes that you had with the races um, believing that, you know, we can plow through something that we think is impossible, but actually it is possible on the other side of things. And you just want to, we want to give that sense, that mindset to other young people, because you know how much agency comes with that. Can you talk a little bit about the, the organization and maybe some stories of young people, some turnarounds that you've seen? I just would love to know more. Yeah, so the program, we started the program Impossible Possible in shortly after I ran across the Sahara. So in 2008, we were sort of, you know, that's when we became a, a 501c3 in the U.S. nonprofit in Canada shortly after. And um, our kids come from everywhere that apply for these expeditions. So I live in Quebec. I've had uh, students from all across Canada apply, United States, Europe. Uh, I don't select the youth ambassadors that go on these uh, programs, but typically it's kids from all different backgrounds, all different demographics, uh, gender, everything. And um, what I find really compelling is when these kids apply to go on these expeditions is because they really want to go and pursue something that's not just about them, but about contributing to something bigger, which is of course the curriculums that we create. So each youth expedition it's comprised of four to five youth ambassadors between the ages of 16 and 21. And as I mentioned, they can be from anywhere. Um, each youth expedition requires them to participate in the adventure anywhere in the world. I mean, it could be the Sahara Desert. It could be the Arctic. It could be uh, South America, Rajasthan. I mean, we've been all over the place. Um, and then a curriculum is tied to each expedition. And that curriculum becomes what these young people through their adventure share create, teach across satellite to classrooms all around the world who are following. And so they become part of this much bigger thing than themselves as one unit, but rather as a whole working with their team and then contributing and communicating with classrooms as they, as they go. Everything we do is hundred percent free of charge and we're all volunteers in the organization. So it doesn't cost these kids to go. It doesn't cost them anything. We provide the gear, um, everything that they need. And then we facilitate as well uh, all the expenses for our volunteer teachers and experts and scientists that join us on these expeditions to help round out the curriculum. So I've seen youth from 
all different walks of life. And I, and it doesn't matter where you come from or what your background is. Everybody can experience their own version of an epiphany or, you know, moment where something spectacular uh, happens. I've seen kids who uh, have been injured on expeditions. Some of the expeditions are much more endurance based than others. And I've seen kids um, get injured and they're unable to continue. And them learning that it's not about giving up. Sure, they could, but instead, it's about how do you adapt when the chips are down? Like, what are you going to do to transform who you are within your team on your expedition to continue to contribute in a way that you find or feel a sense of value from? I think those are the greatest stories that come from the expeditions are those kids who face adversity head on and then reinvent themselves on the expeditions or find a way to dig deep and get through it. Or whatever, but I mean, you know, I've had, I don't know how many, 70 youth ambassadors over the years go on these expeditions, 15 plus youth expeditions and adventures. So every expedition has a story of resilience or of learning or of um, doubts and fear turning to knowledge and uh, elation. You know what I mean? It's all there always. Beautiful. Well, we're going to have information about Impossible to Impossible in the show notes. Now, tell us a little bit about this expedition company that you have. It must be for like corporate leaders or, or something well, like that. Well, it's for everybody. It's for okay. everybody. We do, uh, we have a guiding company called Capic One as well. We, uh, you know, in conjunction, because not only are expeditions important to me and my team, but so is coffee. So we have a coffee brand. Oh. So we've been uh, roasting coffee. We roast in Encinitas, California, and in Ottawa, Canada. And our coffee is available in the United States and Canada. And it's all fair trade, um, small farmer, small co-op, all that. But honestly, we feel it's the best coffee in the world. At any rate, um, through our expeditions uh, that I've done, you know, the, I've crossed every large desert on the planet. The 17,000 kilometers that you talked about, that's most, I think I'm missing just a few, like the Simpson Desert in Australia. But I've crossed the Gobi Desert, the Atacama Desert, the Patagonian Desert, the Sahara Desert the Namib Desert, et cetera, and multiple locations around the world, the coldest places on the planet. And so it's always been sort of my guiding principle that on my expeditions, when I'm out there, find locations that would be great to host youth with the impossible to possible youth expeditions. And we've successfully done that. Well, around 2015, Bob Cox, our executive director of Impossible to Possible, he does a lot of logistics, he's a logistics genius. He was doing logistics on one of my expeditions. And I said, we need to start bringing adults. Because I'm telling you something, adults want to do these things too. They want to go and discover things at 40, 50, 60. I've had clients 65 years old on expeditions with me. And I said, we can do this. Like We can create something really amazing and bring people in small curated groups to these places where the skill level can be and requirement can be higher. The difficulty level can be super high or it could be entry level, but offer something for everyone. And so we've been successfully guiding trips all over the world since 2017. Um, I have clients from, again, like youth ambassadors, I have clients from all over the world that participate in these trips and um, they've all become my friends. And so we've got an amazing calendar of trips going this year and into next year. And uh, you know, we, some are, there are corporate stuff. There are corporate events that I do create in locations and base camp out for, um, you know, for companies to for c suite events or whatever, you know, they want to do, but you know, the bread and butter, the main goal is to get these people, you know, people like you and me out on trips, exploring the world, seeing things in a different light, learning new skills while they're out there. And then through the fees of their expedition, donating back to impossible to possible, a percentage of all uh, of our net goes back to supporting the charity. Okay, so say the name of the company and the coffee company. We're gonna include those in the show notes They're too. both Capic One. They're both Capic One Capic Coffee, one. Capic One Expedition. Go and same website, Capic One, it's K-A-P-I-K, number one.com. Love it. Okay, I'm gonna have to try that coffee. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, you gotta try um, it. You need it we- for all the books you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious okay i have two uh, two questions but i want to slip in a really quick one when you say you've run across all these deserts just like if you had to s- distill it to its baseline why do you do this what is well, it you know okay so this will even drive you even crazier so 
most of the deserts that I've crossed have been in the peak of summer in that desert, whether it's Southern Hemisphere or Northern Hemisphere. And most of my Arctic expeditions or Siberia or Kamchatka or where have been in the peak of winter at the coldest time of year. I don't really like the cold, but you know what I love about the Arctic in winter? Everything around you has a hue of pink and purple because the sun is so low in the horizon that as it casts its its uh, rays across the landscape in that extreme cold and the angle that the sun is at, it it, it is this beautiful light bathes the entire topography of the land. And it's just an amazing and mystical place to be at that time of year. So I go to these places when they're their most extreme because I want to experience Death Valley in the middle of summer or you know, a Baffin Island in the middle of winter and be there and then be able to create content around that, share those experiences with anyone who's following along and, um, you know, experience it myself. And and why do I do it on foot? Because being on foot to me is the way I like to connect to the planet. It's the way I like to explore. There's different ways of doing things and we all have our way of doing things. That's the way I like to do it. Amazing. Okay, so two last questions. You... um made a decision to make your expeditions about social causes and raise money and raise awareness to a large extent. That again is yet another example of what I call purposeful empathy. So I'd like you to just share to what extent you think empathy plays a role in your work and life. You know, I, th- I, I find that really interesting. And, you know, you'd mentioned it earlier at the very beginning of our talk today. And, you know, purposeful empathy, I, I think it's such an, it's, it's a brilliant title like it's, it's i'm assuming you've come up with this concept because it's it's absolutely awesome i love those two words together to me what it means to me when i started doing expeditions i was as you said fundraising for various social causes through the expeditions themselves running the sahara it's joe africa um expeditions after that for various organizations and and uh nonprofits. and then when i started impossible to possible and the work that we are doing with youth, although we are not changing the world, for me, it felt right. It's like when you sit down to eat a meal and you're like, now that's the best meal I've ever had in my life. You just know when it's good and when it's right for you. And for me, being purposefully empathetic means to find the thing that you truly can attach yourself to and understand and it connects with your soul, with your every fiber of your being that you're like, this is what I'm meant to do. And so every expedition since, gosh, it's got to be since 2010 or nine has been in support of my foundation, Impossible to Possible. Because I really find that that, you know, you know, there's some secondary and tertiary issues we're talking about. But in large part, what we're doing with Impossible to Possible is my passion. I love curating, curating but giving youth the opportunity to grow in other ways through doing things for them. It's not me giving, like I'm not giving it, they're they're earning it, they're doing it, right? It's their thing. And then they go on to be future leaders, right? So I figure, hey, you know what? I just throw the tools and they they make it happen. And I mean, literally they make it happen. They navigate on their own expeditions. They do all that stuff. They learn how to do it and then they do it. And so I think that, you know, being truly purposeful, means that you are uh you're you're all in and when you're all in then you really are able to give everything you've got towards the cause that you you know are passionate about love it i know you have a daughter named annika she's hanging in the wings waiting for you i have a daughter named annika too is your spell two n's a n n no i've got i've got a a n i k a Ah, beautiful okay she's how old again 12, just turned 12 wow. and was my okay. running partner in Death Valley. And, uh, you know, kid is an amazing runner. She's good at everything. <laughs> She's uh, a biathlete, does biathlon where they shoot and ski. And the uh, has sprint canoe, does the sprint canoe. You know, when you kneel, have you seen that in the Olympics? Yeah. This crazy sport. The boat is like, it's crazy. It's as wide as your knee, basically. It's crazy. I don't know how they do it. Well, Apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. So I will let you go on this final thought i like to ask my guests at the end of each conversation if they can remember a time in their life when they were on the receiving end of empathy and what that meant for them 
Yes, many times. I think that it's in mentorship. You know, it's a word we use now that I didn't even know about before. But I've had friends who were, uh, you know, friends generationally different. I mean, they're older, they were older, but they'd experienced so much and were willing to impart wisdom at a time, you know, it times up because there's been more than one in my life where I thought, I don't see a path forward or I don't see a way to make this happen. And then they would drop wisdom on you and on me and at that time. And I think what's what was, was critical I can't believe I did this because I'm not normally the brain's not a hundred percent all the time. And but this time and these times I took their advice. And I think that that was a big thing, right? For me is like, I accepted their advice, did what they had told me to do. And with that confidence that they gave me and those strategies that they gave me, I was able to move forward to become and do what it is that I do now. You know, people ask me, do you have any regrets? And I say, Absolutely not. Because if I didn't live the life that I lived up until 30, I wouldn't be living the life I'm living now. Have I learned things from it to maybe suggest to others to avoid hazards like young people? Hey, don't smoke. I mean, obviously, I've learned a lot, but I wouldn't have changed my path. Do you know what I mean? We all make mistakes. We all have things that we regret. But as in a, in a whole, I'm saying, you know, that's how I got here. Nice way to live a life. Well, I know you're off to a, to run on a beautiful, hopefully sunny day in Ottawa. Thank you so much for making the time, Ray. I am so happy that people will get to read about you in this book. You really are a living example of purposeful empathy. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. We'll see you next time at Purposeful Empathy. Thanks so much for watching another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Please subscribe to my channel. Please consider buying a copy of Purposeful Empathy. Remember, the world needs more empathy and you have a role to play.